Good evening uh, to our esteemed guests, uh, panelists and attendees. Uh, welcome to the World University Summit 2024. OP Jindal Global University is delighted to host you for our session titled From Retailers of Knowledge to Creators of Knowledge, Promoting Research Culture for Decolonizing Universities. Our session today aims to unravel and address the transformative shifts which are needed in our higher education institutions, especially in developing countries. I'm Sahana Virajan. I teach philosophy at Jindal Global Business School, OP Jindal Global University, and I'm also a fellow at Jindal India Institute here. I broadly work on care ethics lens as it applies to higher education. So more recently, I've looked at the relation between decolonizing and care. Uh, and I'm excited to learn from our brilliant speakers today. So for decades, universities in the developing world have been positioned primarily as conveyors of established knowledge, acting as intermediaries between the knowledge created in the West and the learners in their own territories. This dynamic has placed these institutions in a role akin to retailers of knowledge, where the act of creating and contributing insights to the global academic discourse is often secondary, if not entirely overlooked, due to various structural and resource-related constraints. However, of course, the tides are turning. There is a growing recognition of the indispensable need for our universities to transition into hubs of research and innovation, into creators of knowledge. This shift is, of course, not merely academic, but also fundamental to addressing the global and local challenges we face today. It is about acknowledging and valorizing our indigenous, local, and non-Western knowledge systems that have been marginalized under the pervasive influence of Eurocentric epistemologies. The challenge is uh, multifaceted. As we push for a stronger research culture within these uh, universities, we confront the entrenched structure of knowledge produ production and dissemination that are dominated by Western corporations and academic norms. This reality begs us to question how we can decolonize the very processes and products of of our academic endeavors, ensuring that they're inclusive, uh, equitable, and resonant with the diverse realities of our global community. Today's uh, session will explore these pressing questions. We have with us an esteemed panel of experts. Each of them bring a wealth of experience and insight from the respective fields, uh, and are ready to share their uh, perspectives on how universities in Global South developing countries can not only engage, but lead the charge towards decolonized, inclusive, and impactful research culture. In next hour, we'll explore specific strategies to integrate indigenous, local, and non-Western knowledge systems into our research paradigms, examine the role of international collaborations in enriching these efforts, and discuss innovative approaches to overcoming barriers to equitable knowledge dissemination. Before we dive in, I'll just share a plan for our session today. We'll start with a quick introduction of our wonderful speakers. Each will then share their opening thoughts with us. Following that, we will move into a 25 minutes moderated question answer session, where I'll ask our speakers some questions to delve deeper into our topic. We'll wrap up with 10 minutes for audience questions, which are collected from our live streams. So um, I'm honored. Uh, it's my it's my pleasure to invite Professor S. Shantara, the esteemed director of Gujarat National Law University, to share his opening remarks. I'll just give a quick introduction. With an impressive 30 years of teaching experience across notable universities, including the Hindialpla National Law University, Professor Shantaram has made significant contributions to the legal field. His expertise spans environmental law, human rights law, international law, and constitutional law. An alumnus of Madras. University with extensive legal practice at the Madras High Court. Professor Shanta Kumar has authored influential works on environmental and human rights law. He's also an active participant in legal education and reform, serving in prominent roles within international and national law associations and committees. Professor Shantaram, your experience and dedication to legal education is, is inspiring to us. We look forward to your inf insights. So please uh, hand over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Sahana. Am I audible? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much, Sayana. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, this is uh, something uh, which I have been talking about at multiple platforms. The topic for today's session is something which worries all of us, uh, all scholars in India, especially the legal scholars. In the context of decolonization, everyone uh, is aspiring to decolonize it. Government wants to decolonize the yes. colonial laws and then come out with our own uh, made our own legislations uh, but unfortunately what's happening is uh, the amount of knowledge that we consume as consumers 
of legal knowledge. We do not create knowledge. So the we we still uh, uh, you know consume knowledge created elsewhere and use it in the Indian context yes. classrooms. We still teach Austin Bentham. I I I'm, I'm again. Uh, I want to uh, give a disclaimer that I don't want to say that we should not teach Austin or Bentham. Right? We should continue to draw uh, inspirations from their work, but at the same time we should also have some Indian names and Indian theories which we should be able to use in our classrooms. So that is the concern. I hope that is the sole point of we meeting together today and talking about how do we yes. how do we move away from being a knowledge consumer to a knowledge creator. So there is only one way I think it can be done. This could be done only by doing a research. Right? So, but then unfortunately, I can only speak of legal research that's happening in India because I come from that discipline. I find that A, uh, the legal research what's happening is not interdisciplinary. But there is a possibility yes. to notice now for the last few years, I find more uh, uh, movement to, from, towards interdisciplinary research happening. But it's it's only in the initial stages. It's a good starting point. I hope things will change. In the years to come, we will have more interdisciplinary research happening in our law schools and universities so that we create uh, a new knowledge, number one. Number two, for uh, historical reasons, you know, in uh, all the law teachers uh, are only familiar with uh, a particular uh, research method called doctrinal research. So you okay. read the doctrines and then you review a few judgments and then you draw your own inferences based on somebody else's work, right? So uh, the, the legal research has not been uh, an exploratory research. It has not been an empirical research. People do not follow an observational study. They don't live with communities. They don't interact with society. And they don't actually look at the real problem from their own perspective. So this is a major uh, uh, weakness I would say as far as legal research is concerned, because we always, uh, legal researchers I have always seen, maybe there might be exceptions here and there, but uh, largely speaking, uh, it's all doctrinal work. They all are keen to doing only a tabletop research. So where they sit before computers, uh, read books and read judgments, and they write their pieces and then say. So the, I, ultimately the end product is not uh, original knowledge. So we do not create knowledge. We Again, in the name of research, we consume someone else's created knowledge, and then we uh, uh, try and give our own interpretations to the existing body of knowledge of law. Uh, instead, you know, we do not have someone creating a new uh, theory, right? So we, of course, there are certain things which is irreplaceable. Like, you know, for example, in sciences, uh, Newton's law of motion is Newton's law of motion. So, but then, you know, we need to, to come out with some equivalent uh, Indian philosophy or theory, which will also explain the law of motion. Similarly, when it comes to justice administration, you know, we need to have our own indigenous system. So we have been uh, completely glued. We are now 75, 77 years after independence. Still, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we have... Uh, not uh, thought about moving away from the, the the justice administration system, what has been created by the British for their own vested interests, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes. uh, so the, I I'm really happy that is why I thank you. This this opportunity, and I must appreciate uh, at least you know universities like General is trying to talk about uh, decolonizing because see th this is a spark, and I think universities should follow General. And then, you know, okay, make it a movement throughout the country yes. and keep yes. talking about it. I think this is a great beginning. And Thank I you. that, uh, you know, uh, this topic should be, uh, uh, the, the, the discussion under this topic should continue across universities so that we encourage the young legal researchers on doing original research work by interacting with people in society so that they actually create some new knowledge of their own experience rather than yeah. quoting X, Y, Z. So this is my initial, in fact, uh, initial observations. 
I will come back again. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shanta Kumar. That was the amazing. Uh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to on. I'm honored to introduce Professor Manisha Priyam, a distinguished professor of education policy and National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration in New Delhi. With a doctorate from London School of Economics and International Development, Professor Priyam is a seasoned academic and researcher focusing on intersection of development and politics, especially in education policy reforms. Her extensive experience includes serving on not several notable national and international committees, uh, advising various government and global organizations on education reform and contributing to policy formulation and evaluation. Professor Manisha is also a reputed voice in both print and electronic media discussing policy and political issues with a global audience. Professor Manisha, we are eager to hear your insights. Uh, please share your opening remarks. Okay. So uh, while we wait for Professor uh, Manisha Priyam to join us again, uh, is it okay if Dr. Uh, uh, Shekhar Vishwanathan, I'm just going to go forward with your introduction. <laughs> of course, you well know uh, he's, he's the vice president of VIT, uh, whose visionary leadership has propelled VIT to the forefront of higher education in India. Professor Shekhar, an alumnus of University of Madras and Rochester Institute of Technology, has over 30 years of experience blending industry expertise with academic innovation. His tenure at VIT is marked by the introduction of pioneering educational programs and initiative like STARS uh, scheme and fully flexible credit system, which has significantly enhanced the academic and social landscape for students. Recognized for his contribution to education with awards and leadership roles in prominent educational organizations, Professor Shaker's impact on Indian higher education is profound and enduring. Professor Shaker, we are eager to hear your insights and experiences. Please, over to you. Thank you, Sahana, um, for this generous uh, introduction. Um, uh, I am very glad to discuss on this topic about uh, moving on to uh, re uh, from uh, retailers to creators of knowledge and especially in the view of decolonization uh, of our universities. Um, <clears throat> uh, the problem is not as acute in engineering and science compared to humanities and social sciences as uh, Professor Shantakumar was earlier uh, mentioning. But still, we do have uh, uh, problems in our areas. I mean, I, I represent engineering and science. Um, but let me first focus on our humanities uh, sections. Um, you know, traditionally, many of our universities are all focusing on Scopus indexed journals. Um, you know, that's because the international rankings are all going after Scopus Index journals. So our policies are also going after Scopus Index journals. So if you look at the Scopus Index journals for uh, humanities and other social sciences, and if you do it in the context of India and give it for publication, how successful are the uh, acceptances? And why are we going after those Western journals? Because we are crazy of the international ranking you know, those uh, famous agencies are going after. So there, there is a big gap there. Um, so I, I think uh, in general, <clears throat> I think uh, we need to have our own Indian research consortium or something like that, where IRC, let's say, where the Indian research organizations and universities come up with our own, you know, journals, uh, you know, <clears throat> so we should not be, going after the benchmarks of the West. We should be having yes. our own benchmarks. So we, you know, are, you know, the, the, especially the global South, the problems are significant when we do research, but it's it's a pity yes. that we get ignored in such uh, West oriented platforms. I think it's high time we form our own uh, indices, uh, research consortium. And uh, I mean, it will be nice if the government takes the lead or even the universities themselves can uh, take the lead on it. Uh, I mean, earlier there was attempt like ERNet, ERNet, and etc. You know, uh, such attempts haven't completely uh, seen their purpose. Uh, we have had national knowledge commission, national knowledge networks, uh, but so far we have not uh, succeeded. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, India is number four in publishing papers next to US. China and UK, whereas it is 95th in the global knowledge economy index out of the 133 countries. India spends only 0.7% of the 
of its GDP on research. They look at the contrast. All of us are chasing papers. Yeah. Right? So, but are we using that knowledge? Are we creating that knowledge? And uh, for the right purpose, we are just publishing papers. So there's a lot to be addressed. And especially if you look at uh, the um, uh, journals, uh, you know, the, the processing fee, the article processing fee, the open access fee. Uh, I, I feel the India is wasting a lot of foreign exchange there. So the, the authors don't get so much of money, the creators of knowledge. It's, it's some journals sitting in the Western nations and we are all crazy about publishing papers there and then we're all crazy about many other things. Uh, so there's a lot to be done. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, Jindal is organizing such a session. I'm, I'm sure we can come to some conclusions here, which could be recommend, given as recommendations. I'll stop right here and then come back later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shekhar. I'm going to hand over. We have uh, Professor Manisha with us now. So please, Professor Manisha, uh, over to you for opening remarks. Uh, thanks so much. And sorry about uh, just disappearing. And that tells you of the perils of uh, <laughs> decolonizing from the global south. Uh, we can talk a lot, but it's all going to be a pie in the sky unless we think about the fact that we require structural and resource-based yes. supports to be able to do that. Uh, chatbots and Zoom meetings can start our dialogues, but they are simply not enough. Remember that best journal article or that good research is never going to be written like that. And yes. my opening comments are going to begin with an eminent teacher called Dr. Radhakrishnan, who spent his life studying as a very poor student in a presidency uh, township of Madras, as it was called then. And he studied on a merit come means scholarship on which he managed himself as a student and also his family. Remember, they were married young then. But the fact is that he grew up young, was offered a job in the universe, in the same college where he studied. And he was, as he came of age, he was writing for international uh, fora, the International Philosophical Association. Yes. And then his articles, he would send to, even to Ravindnath Tagore for peer review and to eminent philosophers outside. The home office would open the letters in which he would ask for comments, seeking peer review comments. And each of those went on water ships and the home office would open it here. It would be open there so that nothing seditious could be carried in the words. And I can tell you that by 1921, he was a man who had never put his foot abroad outside of India. The American Philosophical Association 1921 meeting opened. The opening address was on idealism in the philosophies of, hold on, Dr. Radhakrishnan and Bosanquit. So I think that's for me the ultimate front line of where we could reach. And with these provocative remarks, I would say that the title itself today is a bit provocative. Uh, and I feel that we need to pontificate a bit on what we mean by decolonizing universities as a paradigm of understanding. The term decolonizing has implications for two things, for knowledge systems and for universities. Now, also, the word decolonizing means that there's a primacy of the peoples of the colonial south, not just people, peoples of the colonial south. It's not just about me reclaiming my history or yes. I reclaiming the glorious past. It's about the southern periphery advancing the arguments in the centers of the colonizer north. Now, in doing the, this all this, within the idea of the university, there is a primacy of student teacher voices. Remember Henry Newman, when he imagined the non-utilitarian liberal model of the university, he spoke about the liberal education where knowledge would be produced for itself in collegiality between the students and the teachers. And they assert their voices on and within the university spaces. So when we talk of the journals, remember, a lot of the good universities where I have studied and where I have worked, where I go and speak, there are teacher journals, there are academic journals, there are student journals. In other words, decolonizing has meanings for what we do as educators and how we do it within institutions. It's also a project of reclaiming our public universities. And I, when I say this, I borrow from the title of my own volume, which is Reclaiming Public Universities. Now, the term retailer 
implies that the metropolitan sector center manufactures, but creators also possibly implies the creation of knowledge within the grounded localities of the global south and its universities. It's simply not enough to say that in the 5th century BC, there was a golden past. Maybe there was a golden past, but is there validity to the idea? Is there a global validity to it? Can there be a community of scholars that can sit on the knowledge that we had and create knowledge that can go back to the global center? Remember, the world is flat for knowledge today. And research culture, international collaborations have to be done on a partnership of equals. They need to yeah. overturn what is structurally unequal about this relationship. Now, as I conclude my opening uh, comments, I would like to say that decolonization, of course, has implication for knowledge systems and epistemes. It has very important implications for the university as an organization. And I will give you many more uh, examples of why decolonization simply isn't about reclaiming our past. It's about claiming back the connected histories which have constituted us as modern yet colonial and subjugated citizens and speaking together in a united way as peoples of the global south. And that grand narrative could talk to us and it can talk about a whole process of creativity, which is a creativity of the commons. The university then is not just a public good. It is a good of the commons. It is a commons good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Manisha. I think you you have hit the nail on the head <laughs> with, uh, with that. And uh, I'm just going to, okay, so now we are officially starting our moderated question answer session. And uh, I'm just going to start from where uh, Professor Manisha has just left, right? And I want to open the question, which is a very tricky question. Reclaiming as not reproducing the past. And I really want to understand, you know, I would like to open this and ask uh, Professor uh, Shantaram and Professor Vishwanathan, your perspective on when you think about decolonized education, Education. What do you really feel it stands for, especially given? I, does it mean going back to the past and uh, reproducing what we have done and teaching that? Or does it mean in what? And, and I want to add there, right? If we are talking about not reproducing the past, then how do we do something quote unquote new in the present without having the colonial influence or whatever residual colonial influence is there for the last uh, decades, right? So, um, so you know, uh, is it okay, Professor Shantaram, if I open to you and, you know, if you have any comments, please? Yes, uh, Sahana, uh, see, uh, uh, decolonization and the creation of uh, knowledge does not uh, necessarily involve uh, ignoring all the other advances that has been made elsewhere, right? So knowledge, how does the knowledge grow, right? Uh, we all know as academics that there is a thesis which creates multiple antitheses, right? An hmm. antithesis cannot come on its own without a thesis, you know? So there is a thesis, there is an antithesis, and there is a synthesis, and then, you know, that is how knowledge keeps growing. So there must be inspiration drawn from else. Yes. So let us uh, be open uh, to yes. things coming from across all directions, right? Yes. This is what uh, we have been promoting in the Indian culture, has been accepting, let the knowledge come from every direction. It's, it's there in our systems, in our culture. So it's not that... Uh, uh, Reclaiming the past does not mean that ignoring uh, what is present. So we yes. have to only ensure that the past is not forgotten. Like, for example, I, 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 when I'm talking about the legal systems, see, uh, none of my students know, like, if I ask them in a class, like, how was justice administered uh, before the British could establish these courts in India? Right? How was just, uh, justice administered during the Mughal periods? Right? How was justice administered even before the advent of Mughals? See, as long as human beings are there, disputes exist. But there must be some dispute resolution mechanism. So there must have been something which has been practicing. right? So today what we are now making a law for mediation and all these things, were the things of the past. Today we have given a new name, 
drawing from yes. the philosophies. We are giving a new name to it, but then, you know, the practices are ancient. So that is where we need to actually look into the uh, uh, indigenous knowledge systems. So you need to encourage uh, the exploration and validation of indigenous knowledge systems within academic research. Okay. Um, I'm going to... Uh... Yeah, yeah in, sir, that, that makes complete sense, Professor Shantaram. I do have two, three uh, tangents from there. But before I move on, I'm going to ask Professor Vishwanathan to please share his perspective on this point of reclaiming, uh, our, uh, in reclaiming as not necessarily reproducing the past. Or what What do you feel, uh, you know, where does it lie, right? So. Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I feel that, you know, when you, when you say uh, creation of knowledge, we are not going to reinvent the wheel. We have to advanced knowledge, push the frontiers. We don't have to start the frontier. We have to just push the frontiers. Whether it was done by Westerners or Indians doesn't matter. So we accept what has been uh, you know, created, but then we go further from there. So you know, sometimes we, we uh, had a, you know, wear a hat saying that, you know, I'm going to oppose anything which West gives us. Yes. I, I think that's not the right attitude. It's, it's just that we, we should not become, you know, we should not have that slave mentality or that suppressed mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, we are all equals. So if we have that attitude, so we accept what has been done by the, you know, the Westerners, but we, we go further. We use that and we grow further. I think that should be the attitude and, uh, you know, we don't have to be mm -hmm. antagonizing. We don't have to have that negative feeling at all. But we can grow. Uh, but at the same time, we should not have any kind of, you know, inferiority uh, complex also. So I, I'm sure okay. we're in the right path. Professor uh, Manisha, I'm going to hand over to you. I think uh, you might have a point or two about uh, the comments shared and, you know, what, what do you feel about reclaiming as reproducing the past? What are your ideas? And also, I'll just add in, since you had shared such a provocative opening remark, do you feel that it's possible to receive the West, the ideas of the West without the quote-unquote, like, you know, the cultural trauma that comes with the, the, with the colonialism, right? Do you feel like it's possible to do that? So I just want to hand over to Professor Manisha in case you have any comments on that. So I have many comments and I can tell you decolonizing is a full project and I believe that we India has been a very strong decolonizer. We were not one of the weaker colonies. Remember we were a great trading nation yes. even before the British came in. They came in for the goods, right? Now I'll go on to their project of colonizing of the Indian university and educational system in a bit but let me extend to you the argument of Dr. Radhakrishnan and let me tell you yes. That such was his soaked understanding when he was doing his philosophies. The oh. lectures given by Dr. Radha Krishnan in an undergraduate Maharaja's college were compiled and they were published by a London publisher called C. Hurst and Company. Did he go to the West? Did the West come to him? That's my number one question. And when he published that, he said, more than me, Professor Hiriyana, and there was no difference between Hiryana being a professor of Sanskrit and a professor of philosophy. And he said, more than me, Hiryana is a real scholar, right? See how Austin Company publishes that. Now, Professor Radha, Radha, Dr. Radha Krishnan, he was so poor. And when we, that's why I emphasize the word, not just the West, we have to stop hitting poverty. We are a poor country, so what? There should be no trauma of the West. There should be this photograph we see him in. After class, it would not be worn every day. The silk kachan was for occasions. And if worn, it would be hung there. And after class, the doors were open for students to come. What kind of a life the man had? Personal life. Absolutely unknown. Because there was no other life except the life of deliberation, the life of the nation to be realized in teaching and learning. And let me also tell you that he was an internationalist of one kind. He did not have the money to be able to travel abroad and study anywhere abroad, but sufficiently international. Teaching what? Teaching Indian philosophy. So I'm not saying don't go back to the past, but how you do it? He stands up to Bosanquet. In 1917, when Gandhi comes in, there's a famous meeting between Gandhi and Radha Krishnan that happens in Chennai. And Gandhi tells him that in the jungle, there is very little uh, ill health. And there's no need for medicines. And Gandhi was then by then thinking of the experiments with life that he wanted to do. 
his system of natural life, natural medicines. But here was Dr. Radhakrishnan who turned back to Gandhi and he had one question to ask him, which was, how do you know? And this tells you that modern knowledge is produced by constantly creating the counterfactual, the law of falsifying, the law not of confirming beliefs and truths. I believe this is the best. So no, the law of falsifying and the India's best is not. India's best is that India's monks who were monks by renunciation with their begging bowl and their argument, not even knowing Mandarin language, Buddhism was able to travel all through Southeast Asia with the argument of the monk and not the power of Ashoka. So I tell you today, it is important for us to recreate the argument and not the belief simply by assertion, but by falsification as Radha Krishnan could in fact stand up to Gandhi. There are many dialogues between Ravindranath Tagore and Gandhi that happen. And I'm happy to see that Gurudev Ravi Thakur is very happy to see Gandhi. Gandhi stays in Shanti Niketan. But the arguments are like this. Two models of alternative education taught by Ravindranath Tagore who believed in internationalism, who believed that the world ravaged by World War I can become one if knowledge becomes cosmopolitan and then wants to open a university where in a village and critical as much as internationalism was, rural reconstruction was critical to Ravindranath Tagore. So that's why I have said of what we teach, decolonization is a project of knowledges it's about what we teach. It's about a project of the institutions we set up. I'm going to conclude by telling you that the arguments that happen between two intellectuals since we were opposing the British. Remember, those arguments were about knowledge. Those arguments were also about the fact that some youngsters believed that the British project was so harsh that they needed to be taken away out of this country by the barrel of the gun. And these were not people who were, uh, you know, breaking laws or anything like that. Vivekanand, Swami Vivekanand's brother was part of that, Anushilan Samiti. And Khudiram Bose was a part of this. And he believes in a small town in Bihar, in Muzaffarpur, he goes and he does the attack, etc., etc. The end was that Khudiram Bose does not own up that he did anything wrong. He does not recognize the body of Praful Chaki. He says, no, no, this is not Praful Chaki. This is some other person. But the end is, Khudiram Bose writes a poetry that was sung on the streets of Bihar and Bengal, but even by the beggars. That is the power of poetry created. When India could not, under British subjugation, create scientific knowledge because our trajectory was taken away from us. Gurudev Ravindranath's yes. poetry, as much as Khudiram Bose's poetry, which I want to quote here, it says, Ebar Bida Dema, Phire Asho. He touches the motherland and he says, This time, Ma, let me go. I will come back again. And this becomes the poetry which reigns the times. I conclude by telling you that on this event, the eminent Bal Gangadhar Tilak who fought for the right to education, he and Gandhi disagree. But Tilak says, I will not agree with Gandhi. And in the editorial in Kesari, Tilak writes that here is a youth who will be icon for the times. Gandhi says, this is not how we can win freedom. So this is the argument tradition. On the death and sacrifice also, two traditions happen. And this is the country that I'm proud of. This is the country whose land, whose earth I can touch and I can live the life of centuries. That's the kind of knowledge we have. Yes. But it's not a knowledge of confirming ill-gotten beliefs. It's a tradition of knowledge, argumentation and creating knowledge even in the face of colonizer or Western or British adversity whatever you want to call it. So, Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Manisha. There's so many points there, but I want to pick up one point there, right? What we consider to be knowledge, right? Like, because, you know, we submit papers to journals, which is what, you know, we were also talking about when we write. What is knowledge is also in many senses then decided by, you know, we, it is in the form of papers that we accept knowledge through a particular process. Of course, no one is to deny. Here, of course, we are here to talk about plural ways of bringing knowledge in so even though that is one way of doing it i feel that you know do you feel in any way i wanted to get your perspective 
do you feel the way in which we produce and disseminate and share our knowledge also affects because you know professor manish also shared about poems right we have mythologies we have poems we have stories we have lore aphorisms and who uh, in your perspective especially as people who are educational leaders what decides what knowledge is who in what way can we say this is knowledge in a particular paper within a journal of course it has to be an epistemic filter there has to be a review but who reviews where does it get reviewed right so i want to get your overall perspective for on what form can knowledge take do we decide that a uh, paper which comes into journals is what is knowledge second even if that is the case then how do we dismantle the reproduction of that power imbalance because like you just shared most of the editorial boards most of the journals where we do get published are placed within the global north right so both of those questions i'm going to open um, you know professor uh, shantaram is it okay if i start come to you first yes please yeah <clears throat> see uh, when we talk about creating knowledge and especially in the context of decolonizing we are talking about indigenous knowledge so we are talking about uh, you know creating knowledge about our own society about our own people about our own problems about our own ways of solving those problems using you know not only traditional knowledge but also modern uh, knowledge i i Uh, I appreciate uh, what Mr. Vishwanath was mentioning that uh, you know it will need not be reinvented just for the sake of inventing. If already is there, now we will have to add incremental in in invention innovations to it and see that it is better. And then we we need to create something. For that, you know, there the focus of research, the focus on we we need to uh, emphasize uh, contextualize the research. the focus on research that addresses the specific challenges and opportunities of the local context. this could involve studying issues such as the environmental sustainability or public health and economic development within the framework of the local communities needs and aspirations that is where you know we can uh, we can uh, create something for ourselves something which will be exclusively ours applicable to our uh, immediate neighborhood so for that you know we need to align our research with the national priorities we need to ensure that the research agendas align with the national development priorities and contribute to addressing you know pressing societal challenges by focusing on issues of national relevance universities can actually demonstrate their commitment to serving the needs of their communities while maintaining their unique uh, epistemic identities so this, this is how i think we can create knowledge okay. which will be relevant for us which will be useful for us it may be in any form it may be in the form of a research paper it may be in the form of a phd thesis it may be in the form of a dissertation it may be yes. a simple editorial but then there must be I... something in that we need to make. thank you professor shantaram i'm just going to hand over to professor uh, vishwanathan here please could you please share your perspective on this yeah when it comes to uh, the forms of knowledge um being in an engineering science dominated institution uh, apart from paper publications we give a lot of weightage to patents and products so um, <clears throat> what happens is the uh, for example even for a phd we have said um, even if you are doing a patent you know instead of a paper publication that is fine so you know when it comes to patent again uh, it, we want that patent to lead to a product or service which is useful to the society and in general uh, at vit what we encourage is students to solve local problems you know, yes what, you know you step outside the campus you have myriad of problems to solve especially engineering and science students you can go and help the farmers you can help the poor people uh you know get away from uh, poverty there are so many problems in our society and you know uh, we need not look at the global north we have so many issues in fact we have more problems to solve than the developed world so we should take our problems and solve it and you know use that knowledge to create a product which will which can scale up to uh, you know national level or even international level so knowledge can take various forms but uh, as a university it's our uh, responsibility to solve local and national level problems first thank you 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vishwanathan. I'm going to hand over to Professor Manisha here and ask her views about uh, knowledge sharing. And uh, if you feel like, you know, uh, do you feel that uh, there can be many ways in which we share knowledge? And how do we get this recognized within the Global South? And how do we make an effort? So what are your pers perspective, Professor Manisha? Over to you. So I have to tell you two things here. I, and here I can tell you that I hold a lot of my esteemed colleagues in Hayload universities in India in utter disregard for the kind of trash that is produced. And just by saying, oh, the journals are Global North, etc. I very much sit here. I very much research on problems that are embedded here. In fact, at my uh, doctoral committee meeting, I was awarded my PhD. I was told before the Viva, we award you the PhD. Tell us what your plans are. And the committee had ended by offering me to stay on at the LSE with a postdoctoral leading to a track there. I said, no, I will live where my research questions are. Me and my research questions are not to. After that, many years after having, uh, you know, uh, got out of there, that life has meant that my external supervisor's last visit to India is on a long flight to see what their student is doing. And if I do not mm. complete my articles with sufficient standards, I get the rap that I don't see my colleagues getting. And for the hard labor, I do a day's job, which is full of everything Indian. And I do a night's job after looking after a household of producing articles that are world-class and go through all the pains. And let me tell you that a lot of what we say that the North is doing, not one article of mine has been rejected by the global North because the arguments were from the global South or that I was sometimes using Hindi words, telling them that none of your English words are expressing what I have to tell you. And they have all yes. been accepted yes. in English. So therefore, what was it that they came very hard on? Sometimes the revision process has been two years long. But every idea that I had through this process of polishing and chiseling has finally found itself, if you are an academic, some professions may be about walking the ramp. The academic process is about the hard work of the teacher, Dr. Radha Krishnan, he may be about seeking peer review. The community makes you a scholar. Yes. And remember, in the global north, let me tell you, when Charles Darwin went around on his ship and he came back, his ideas were not immediately accepted. They were rejected. And let me tell you that the maker of the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, the society rejected the ideas. The periodic table classification was accepted much later. So as an academic, you have to understand that you have to show enough proof of how you have done it. You have to withstand the test of counterfactualism. You have to withstand every idea which is counter to your idea. You cannot say that, no, 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 I will not. No, you have to respond to the peer reviewer's comments. And I think yes. that polishing one way of polishing that I have gathered, I never flaunt my Western degrees and I never dress Western or try to even talk in that uh, accent. But the one quality that I keep with myself is that my gurus have told me once critiqued, accept the critique. Do not stand up to say, oh, I'm greater than the criticism. Yes. Be humble and interrogate yourself with the critique. And I think India is yet to come up with even one journal in the social sciences that I would consider to be of the rank and reputation of what I have done. And I can tell you that it is this absolutely grueling taskmaster-like approach of my teachers. They could be Western or non-Western. 83 data tables in my PhD. The way in which the demographer who was my academic supervisor, he said, I don't want to lift my pencil when you finally submit this. But along with a text word, 83 tables go without a mistake. And that mm. level of perfection to be taught by someone. And when I had asked him before going for my viva, what's your best guess about how I will fare? And he had told me, if you get an 18 month revision, I'll be very glad. Never telling me, oh, you're so good that you need never ever. And then when finally I came out and told him that the PhD is awarded sans the viva, he just dropped, he put off the lights in his room. He couldn't believe it. So I'm not praising that system, but I'm telling yes. you how that system produces scholars is something worth emulating. 
today unfortunately my peers are about my promotion is overdue can you publish my article with a back date can you today somebody from an eminent university has fought with me saying that can you publish my article without bibliographic references is that something to be accepted and a strong criticism of our own cultures of our own yes. trajectories simply lambasting the west is where it is it doesn't need us we need ourselves we need to be under the sunlight of who we are you tell me is there a grammatical error in shushrut or charvaks they wrote about health systems do you find a grammatical yes. error in it they didn't have time to revise or redo how did they do it they have stood before that canon was written is there a history that tells us how the proofs were done how the research was done we have no idea so the canon is not to be taken as the canon the canon is to be taken as a process and the product is to be taken for the quality that in years in it not to reify it as oh this came out from the spouting word of the god it lives on palm leaves it lives on bark trees it lives on yes. paper it lives in the mysore manuscript 40000 palm leaf manuscripts not a mistake in one of them of spellings how does that happen yes. you know so that is worth emulating and if it is tradition so be it i will emulate it in whichever time period it was best i will emulate it in whichever geography it is best but i will not lay to rest till i find the pen woman shape of the very best coming out from the global south yes sir thank you thank you professor manisha for that and this reminds me of uh, something that professor vishwanathan had shared in the beginning where he talked about journals within the global south which you know also need to uh, make sure that we come to and of course you know you're absolutely right professor manisha that we are what we are emulating is perhaps the process and uh, and the and the rigor of the process and not necessarily the content uh, necessarily every time right so uh, that makes complete sense i just want to go to a question because i had to move on to the audience question so before i do that i want to ask one question right which is something that uh, professor manisha did touch upon uh, the mindset uh, the decolonizing the mindset of the indians right which which is which is uh, which in some ways of course is expressed through the ways we talk the ways the language we talk in what we wear where we sit how we sit of course we do not unfortunately see uh, palm leaves in uh, boardrooms today and we do not see indian clothes being worn as much and uh, so i want to understand from you and this and at some level it soaks into and leads to the mindset at the end of the day what do we really hold as valuable and i want to understand from you in what ways can universities create an environment create conditions where students are gradually learn to question the kind of uh, you know these uh, colonized uh, be lifestyles right how do we learn to question them do you feel that universities have a responsibility and if yes then you know maybe one or two ways in which uh, we can uh, do this right so professor shantaram i'm going to hand over to you please come <laughs> so the first thing is uh, I, i what what universities need to do is it should uh, promote scholarly networks it should uh, encourage faculty members and students to participate in conferences like this and then you know workshops and exchange programs so this exposure to diverse perspectives and methodologies can actually enrich uh, their research and contribute to the university's uh, global visibility the second thing what i want to say is you know, the universities need to strengthen the research infrastructure Uh, you need to uh, create a good laboratories good libraries good computing facilities to support high quality research and uh, access to state of the art equipments and resources only can enhance the competitiveness of the research that right collaboration with uh, multiple partners the third thing what i would suggest is you should invest in talent development the university should provide support for faculty development we should include a training in research methodologies Uh, we should you know incentivize writing and publication and then train them on publication strategies investing in the professional growth of faculty members alone can enhance the quality and relevance of research outputs for example you know i have a, a, a university nearby uh, the a new vice chancellor joined that university and then uh, he 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 only uh, uh, within a year you know the research output in fact it became so huge that I, it, it was a talking point in the neighborhood then when i asked him that how did you know that he said you know the people were writing but then they did not know how to convert this writing into patent so what i did was i just gave them the knack of uh, patenting this writing whatever they have done and therefore uh, it uh, resulted in the patent filing whether it was granted or not the second 
but then at least they have a huge volume of patents filed uh, within that given year. So it is the knack of doing things which is which really matters. In fact, and you need to handle them and train them and tell them that how it should be done. Yes. That is that is something which is very, very important because today uh, researchers are keen to do good research, but then they do not know where to start, how to start, how to go about it. So uh, handholding is required. Thank you. I think that is where universities can collaborate and as uh, what Mr. Vishwaram was mentioning, we need to create a network of researchers and then start uh, working on that to ensure that they produce some high quality uh, indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shantaram, uh, Shantakumar. I'm just going to hand over to Professor uh, Vishwanathan here, please. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you were talking about uh, the cultural aspects. Yes, the mindset. And... Yeah, mindset, etc. So as a university, we don't get into, for example, uh, the dressing of a student, whether it's Western. Of course. Or, you know, it's their individual uh, freedom to where they want. So we, and you know, how they speak, whether it's a uh, Indian accent or a American accent. So we don't get into that. It's an individual's choice. Uh, so that part, I think we keep away from uh, many of these uh, things. And coming back to uh, the research aspect of uh, this entire uh, thing, um, <clears throat> as uh, Professor Shantakumar pointed out, you know, we, we need to, uh, you know, train our faculty to, you know, just the polishing. You know, the, I think uh, we need to do to make sure the research outcomes are coming out properly. You know, there are a lot of uh, very great minds with us, but just that sometimes expression is a problem. So, and you know, such soft skills could be trained. So those are some of the ideas we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vishwanathan. I'm going to uh, request Professor Manisha in case, you know, you have anything to share, please. On, on what thing you want to say? On we were talking about the mindset. We, we were talking about uh, the cultural aspects of it, right? Of course, you're absolutely right, Professor Vishwanathan, that uh, we do not mandate. Of course, as universities, we are a space where we allow students to question and critically explore. So that makes complete sense. This is Manisha, what do you feel about, of course, you know, when you talk about emulating the West, the process of rigor, I completely understand. What about the cultural aspects? How do you feel that, uh, you know, those within, especially within the university, do you think education has any role in questioning the cultural norms that have uh, emerged. So what do you? What are your perspectives on that, especially so in relation India to is a country of forty thousand colleges and over one thousand universities? Yes, and I can tell you. And in my life after my PhD, I think I've really seen the landscape of India, and my, yes. my anguish comes from the fact that there is, of course, we are nowhere near the professional standards. Forget the West. I find that Brazil produces better papers than us in many areas. These days, I'm reading up a lot on constitutionalism for various aspects of how the functioning of university senates were defended through courts. And I have found that the constitutionalism, even on those aspects, is far superior than whatever could have. Now, forget that. We are neither protecting our ancient. I can give you n number of yeah. examples. You may not have time for that. Found in Jabalpur University, for example, a classification of the library based on computerization system did not know how to, they had Upanishads and they did not have the way of barcoding it and putting them on the stacks. So I found a lot of excellent documents on the ground. Mm -hmm. I found an excellent physics lab, which was referred to as Murti Sahab Ka lab. And I was told Professor Murti was in the line of uh, you know, CV Raman, etc. Give you an example of University of Mysore, which had its own press called the Presality. TV put up, you know, Kuempu's poetry. So today we are telling us, oh, we don't know how to do poetry, etc. Fact is, we have to have a culture of excellence. And that culture is not about what, you know, yes. culture, not cultural sense, but the culture that the academia needs to embrace. And that culture is not the pop culture. That culture is a culture of complete devotion. Our Gurukuls did very well because of complete devotion and focus, like the point of a top. And that's what I find missing. I also find missing, for example, in my vast majority of peers. You know, they know that if one minority is going to come, that minority is not a religious minority in the academia. Anybody who writes excellent journal articles and books is the minority. And you will find that there is a subculture yes. that 
कि ये रिसर्च करते हैं इनको इंडिया में कैसे पढ़ाया जाता है ये नहीं आता है सो वाइल वी आर बर्निंग द मिड नाइट ऑयल द वास्ट मेजोरिटी इज एक्चुअली वाइलिंग अवे दर टाइम पॉलिटिकिंग आई थिंक एकेडीमिया हैज टू बी इंसुलेटेड फ्रॉम एनी अदर थॉट एक्सेप्ट प्रोड्यूस न्यू नॉलेज बींग कोलिजियल विद टीचर a lot of our uh, even in the madras presidency for example thesis were sent anywhere in the world for checking one examiner could be here one examiner could be on a sample if we can take the publications of 10 vice chancellors in india and send it for peer review anywhere in the world vice chancellor should be open to disclosure deans heads of department be yes. open to disclosure and say that to promote this i mean ultimately you have to understand that a china has been able to get there with a loan taken in 1995 from the bank on a planned development how do we get there simply by promoting a culture of rigorous yes, excellence in the short term there is no shortcut to this and that has to be adopted even if the agenda and platform change to become that of decolonization this has to be done remember even in indigenous knowledge systems we've been training a lot of uh, you know ayurved college uh, principals etc uh, publishing test 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 publish yes. publish publish that's indigenous knowledge system of china or brazil are doing better than us because they publish more so we have to get on to that track it's a reality that we cannot escape okay uh so uh thank you so much professor manisha for sharing that and we are nearing our session the conclusion of our session and you know as we draw this uh discussion to a close i want to express my deepest gratitude for our esteemed panelists and to all of us who are joining us today on the live stream uh today we have tried to untie some of the complexities of decolonizing research and the challenges which are there so what resonates with me and i hope with you as well is the collective vision that we all are sharing for an academia where diverse knowledge systems are not only acknowledged but equally valued and integrated through a culture of excellence uh, through an and you know our di dialogue today has underscored the importance of dismantling historical power imbalances and embracing a more holistic approach to knowledge one that honors and incorporates indigenous local no, uh, non western perspectives along with traditional western paradigms uh, these uh, insights shared by our panelists today have illuminated the path towards uh, towards achieving this vision and uh, and you know as we conclude i'm reminded of the timeless wisdom which was encapsulated in this sanskrit shloka which was savidya ya vimukti which basically means true liberation is that uh, true knowledge is that which liberates the ancient of course ancient saying from our heritage embodies the essence of what we aspire to achieve through decolonizing education it is a reminder that the ultimate goal of knowledge is not just the accumulation of facts but a liberation of the mind an expansion of our perspective and the inclusion of diverse wisdoms uh, let this guiding uh, principle light our path as we embark on uh, towards an academia that embraces the vast ocean of global knowledge together let us liberate enlighten and unite through the power of education thank you once again to everyone for joining us uh, for this session uh, have a great evening thank you thank you sir thank you very much thank, thank you, you.